Making your first million is difficult. Making your second million is inevitable once you make your first million. So I can assure you, um, many people have got into the real estate market and become just mum and dad property investors and done very well from the asset class. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, another code cracker. Yes, we're going to dig into some principles behind investment. We're going to take a look at why we need to be an investor. And of course, we're going to dig into some of the big fears people have around investing and how if you can put the right ingredients in, you can create an input-output equation that ends up with some fantastic tangible assets. And of course, I think it's an important skill set to become a good investor because there are so many ways people don't make money out of real estate. Today, having advice coming from just about everybody in the media online, family and friends. And of course, a lot of that advice doesn't really pay off. So I want to give you some opinions on choosing the right real estate, understanding investment grade real estate, and digging into just about all things real estate. So hey, welcome back to the show regulars. Play the program in double speed. Get your life back. And of course, all the episodes I've done are actually lessons on real estate. So feel free to dart about if it's your first time tuning in. Well, I'm having a cup of coffee while I'm doing this podcast. And uh, yes, I bought this aluminium mug on the side of a road at a truck stop in the middle of the desert, if you're watching on YouTube. But hey, I've also got a new hat and uh, I don't think it suits my head. It's, uh, what brand is this hat? It's a, uh, I don't know. I think it comes from Japan. It's a Mason Kitsune. So if you're Japanese, maybe you know of Mason Kitsune hats, but uh, I think Japanese people must have fluffy hair because this hat's way too big for my head. But hey, I'm going to wear it. I'm going to see if I can get my bald head to mold into this hat. All right, I'm going to have a sip of coffee. Yes, wow. Maybe that's the new approach to podcasting, basically talking about hats and coffee and aluminium coffee cups. But hey, we need to invest. That's the reality of life. Uh, Australia is an expensive place to live. It's a high-income society. And of course, it's getting tough for people to save their way to a financial free place. It's not possible. You can't get up every day and go to work and exchange your time for money and ultimately end up in a financial place. It's not going to happen. And, uh, you know, I was just TikToking before and, yeah, I saw uh, an interesting chap talking about the fact that, uh, you know, people in Certain industries may never own real estate now just because of the payment profile. And, you know, his uh, take on it was everyone's now doing OnlyFans to keep up with uh, real estate investment. So uh, I don't know. I don't think that sounds like much fun either. So there are some ways we can get into the market and make money. Making your first million is difficult. Making your second million is inevitable once you make your first million. So I can assure you, um, many people have got into the real estate market and become just mum and dad property investors and done very well from the asset class. But we need to invest because we don't know how long we're going to live for. No one can see the future. Today, Australians are getting much older and living a lot longer. 
And of course, uh, if you really want to understand why you need to build wealth, it's getting to the other side of that because, uh, you know, you want to be able to, to live on your terms. You don't want to be under the rule of the government and living off their handout. You want to be able to live on your terms. But the reality is we need to fix our financial gaps as we grow in life. And of course, one gap is our taxes. Second gap is beating inflation, which today I think most people understand what inflation is. The third gap is building an asset base, putting enough money into our super and making sure we actually have a plan on how we're going to enter our older space of retirement. Now, if you're young listening to this, you're probably going, well, I just want to buy a property. I just want to get into the market. But it all does link together because there are no doubt periods of our life where we will have good levels of income. Other periods of our life, we may face things like marital breakdowns, um, redundancy, all sorts of things can affect our work span. Of course, our health span means that for a lot of people, they physically, particularly people who use their body to work, physically cannot get past the age of 55 doing the same job they've always done. And of course, our life is continuing to improve our lifespan. So we've got a limited work span, a health span, which can stop us from working. Then we've got a much longer lifespan. So in general, people tend to be fearful of investments. And uh, for a lot of people, they either get into investments too late once they finally conquer their fear. Sometimes that Late arrival is okay. Other times it's just simply way too late in an economic sphere to do anything that's going to move the needle. But without question, I think if you were to break down 10 fears that are pretty common for people to sit on the fence with property, it's the fear of financial risk. People don't understand finances. They don't understand the financial well and they see it as risk. They see the market is risk. They see all sorts of headlines that the market could collapse. Uh, the market could do something strange. And of course, in property, a lot of people have a fear of even owning a property, dealing with things like maintenance costs, uh, dealing with the idea of a commitment fear, if you like. And of course, a lot of this goes back to ultimately a lack of knowledge. And of course, uh, a lot of people have a fear of debt, having to own something and actually pay for it um, is quite uh, fearful, particularly if you don't feel like you have your life in order. One of the beautiful things about property is it actually can create a effect where things that are not in order in your life can become in order because of the idea of having to pay a mortgage. But there's all sorts of fears, fears of legal issues, um, the fear of being wrong, making a wrong choice in the real estate economy. And I think the reality is for people, they need to learn to overcome those fears. And really to understand how to overcome those fears, you need to create an input system that creates an output, an input uh, leading indicator would be to get some financial knowledge, to understand risk, to understand property, to understand uh, a, building a team, to understand what it takes to be an investor, a time horizon. The output is going to end up being tangible assets, financial well-being, a full-on economic moat that if something happens in your life, you can adjust your world and ultimately financial independence. So if you put the work in, the input, financial knowledge, risk, yes, you're going to need a little bit of money. 
you're going to get an output. Again, making your first million is hard. Second million, really, it's a matter of just it unfolds on itself. And that's the nature of building wealth. Now, I've had periods of my time and life where I've not made any money, but I've had real estate. I've been able to sell real estate. And that is, in my viewpoint, a economic moat. And of course, this is what happens to a lot of people is they feel very safe in their job. They feel safe with the amount of cash they might have in the bank. But all of a sudden, something happens which comes unexpectedly. And all of a sudden, they feel a little bit naked, so to speak, because their economic moat is not as big and as powerful as they once thought. And of course, Having some real estate in your portfolio, economically speaking, is a great way to protect yourself from the future unknowns. But hey, the government would probably have you thinking that your superannuation is going to be the way for you to retire. Of course, I am a big fan of super. I think it is a... uh, great vehicle here in Australia that, um, you know, people can put away some pennies for a later date and all those pennies they put into super, they can't touch to a later date, which is probably the best part of super. But uh, according to certain superannuation, uh, I guess, uh, forums, a couple on around $40,000 or $780 a week is considered modest level of wealth in retirement. A couple is deemed comfortable at $62,000 in retirement or closer to $1,200 a week. A single considered modest at $28,000 or $540 a week and single considered comfortable at $44,000 or $850-odd per week. Now, I'm going to have a sip of coffee because I have a frog in my throat. There we go, cleared. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds horrible. That sounds absolutely horrible. I'm horrified, I'm mortified, um... To, to understand that our major superannuation funds are suggesting that you're going to be okay if you're a couple, two people living off $1,200 a week. Now, obviously, with these statistics, they tend to not mention that they expect you to have paid off your home and uh, that you're going to live off that $1,200 a week. But as we know, uh, even council rates, car mechanics, starting a car, going out to dinner, uh, you can pretty well burn through $1,200 a week pretty quickly. So whilst it's not the worst uh, a level of worldwide retirement money, I think we all want to end up in a place which perhaps packs a bit more punch than uh, the old $1,200 a week for a couple or $800 a week for a single. So one day you're going to stop working and uh, you're going to need to uh, face the facts that your pension, your super and any other assets that you've assembled along the way can create an income for you. Now, I think really, and even superannuation people suggest it, you're broke if you're taking home $500 a week passive income. You're effectively broke. A little bit more independent, um, and I guess what the superannuation folks see as comfortable is, is what I would refer to as independent which is that circa $1,200 a week per couple. But if you're going to be financially free, you ultimately need to double that $1,200. $1,200 each sounds a lot better than $1,200 per couple. 
with things like healthcare costs, um, you know, um, you know, yeah, basically transport costs, housing costs, going to need a little bit more. So you start to get rich when you're getting about $3,000 a week to $4,000 a week coming in from assets. And I think really what a good number is, is over $5,000 a week coming in from income. Now to get there, if you were starting today and you wanted those assets to spit out $5,000 a week in income, you're probably going to need around $5 million worth of assets paying you a 5% return to take home $5,000 a week, 5% net. So your super, your shares, your property, it's got to do some work for you. And uh, again, some of these things can be sped up if you know how to hack the system. Obviously, for a lot of people, it's quite daunting considering having $5 million worth of real estate. So there are ways to adjust the metric. There are ways to create more cash flow from property. There are ways to hack the system. So I think it's important consideration that you need to invest in the right property, the right property. What I find is novice investors, even first-time purchasers, tend to not invest in the right property. They tend to buy in their own backyard, usually based on some sort of money idea or money fear, um, the fear of not seeing my property, those type of things. And of course, uh, becomes a bit of a stab in the dark for a lot of people, property investment. They, uh, they spend uh, a l basically no time researching property, go to a few open homes, and uh, before you know it, they've gone and bought a property. There are so many examples of loss making real estate in uh, in in everyday economics, and uh, you can get a summary of loss making real estate by just looking at uh, you know, for example, <clears throat> winners and losers reports from real estate. But there is a high percentage of people that do not make money out of real estate. So, of course, for a lot of people who have a fear of financial risk, and of course, hearing that a lot of real estate does not make people money, then you put that combination together and no one's going to be uh, investing in the real estate market. So why do people make a loss? Well, firstly, they listen to the wrong people. People will listen to non-consequence advice. And what do I mean by that? Well, your friends will give you advice, but there really is no consequences if that advice doesn't pay off. Social media, chat rooms will give you advice, but it is of no consequence if the advice actually works. News media will give you opinions and advice. It's non-consequential advice. The wrong people giving you advice is usually people who aren't in your life for the purpose of advice and the purpose of wealth creation. Again, even buying off a real estate agent, real estate agents will give you all sorts of conclusions on real estate. Of course, most real estate is sold and you and the real estate agent never see each other again. I would call that no consequence advice. So <clears throat> why do people make a loss in real estate? They listen to people who have no consequences when it comes to what to buy, where to buy and how to buy. Conversely, some people deal with those experts who basically have consequential advice. For example, myself, I've spent my life in real estate. It's a consequence if I get it wrong. My brand gets tarnished. 
I've operated a licensed real estate for 21 years. There's consequences to that. I've helped thousands of people invest in real estate. There's consequences to that. I employ 141 people. There's consequences every day I wake up and talk about real estate. My name is on the door and I'm responsible for well over 100 people's livelihood. So the advice better be good. And so my consequential advice, I don't even know if that's the right word, definitely outweighs the non-consequence advice that most people will give you. The other people, the other reason people make a loss in real estate is they do not have a singular focus. Most people get up, go to work, do all sorts of jobs and do not have a full-time focus in real estate. It's just not possible. Unless you work in the industry, in investments, it's not possible to have a focus in property investment if you get up every day and do another job. It's just not possible. So most people have the ability to buy in real estate, but lack the capability to buy in real estate because they cannot create a single focus. So obviously, having a single focus allows you to find the best deals, the best real estate, to avoid the loss-making real estate in the marketplace. The third thing as to why people lose money in real estate is people don't understand cash flow. You can tell there's basically over 1.2 million people that own one investment property. But by the time it gets down to someone owning three investment properties, that number drops a lot. It goes from 1.2 to 153,000 people. So 153,000 people in Australia today have three or more properties and those people understand cash flow. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to build that portfolio of three properties. Six properties is even tougher, which is 14 odd thousand people. So again, uh, building and understanding cash flow is a skill set that allows you to build your asset base. And of course, I think why people make a loss on real estate is people sell too soon. There is some statistics on short-term resales in capital cities and on average, the combined regional markets, people will resell under three years, uh, 21% of the marketplace. In capital cities, it's closer to 15%. So 15% of investors get into the market and within three years, they're out of the market. And you have to ask yourself if it was a great property, you're probably going to not ever want to let it go. So, so many people do not see out the correct time horizons in real estate. And of course, the other reason why I think people make a loss in real estate is they buy the wrong property in the wrong area. They buy a market lemon, a time bomb, a hyper-supplied property, a renovation nightmare property, a crime house, a back pocket thief, a too heavily negatively geared property, or they buy a property which is an environmental hazard. So knowing this, we can make some incredibly sound decisions on how to go and find the right property. Remember, obviously, for us as a property investor, we're trying to create assets that then create income for us later in life. And of course, probably beyond going to your local open home up the street to buy a property, there are other ways to play the game. And of course, I would call this tier one research and tier one growth. When it comes to choosing property, 
it's very important to have a five-factor approach, academic approach, a fundamental approach, a physiological approach, a mathematical approach, and a human-first approach. When I find real estate, I use the five-factor approach to buy the real estate in the marketplace and apply a growth model which, as everyone knows, listening to this podcast, is my 4X growth plan. So often you'll hear or you'll you'll hear the conversation, buy an investment-grade piece of real estate. And it's a great, great suggestion because an investment-grade piece of real estate is special It's in a good lifestyle area. It's in a nice street and a nice block. It's it's a safe piece of real estate. Uh, It's in a strong area of rental demand. It has good growth drivers on the asset. The maths make sense. And the property is in line with the cycle which you are buying in. These are all some of the fundamentals. And of course, a tier one investment grade consideration is the right cycle, the right economic growth, the right city fundamentals, the right infrastructure, the right agent of transformation, the right owner-occupier percentage in the neighborhood, the right market indicators, the right demographic profile, the right level of transportation and movement for a market to be considered a tier one investment grade area. And of course, when you think about the property, property's got to carry owner-occupy appeal. It's got to have some built-in value to it. It's got to be driven off zoning or scarcity. It's got to have a decent level of land to asset and land to free space ratio. It's got to have an add value component to it, driven off the back of renovating or building or pre-construction or developing or amalgamations or subdivisions. It's got to be low maintenance and not full of capital costs. And it's got to have a great layout and design to be considered investment grade. And of course, when you think about uh, what I just spoke about, it's not as easy as it sounds to find that type of real estate. There are 11 million properties in Australia, of which at any one time, 250-odd thousand are on the market. 5% of that 250,000 are considered investment grade. So it's about 12,500 properties on the Australian market at any one time. But of course, investors have a budget, and for 50% of that product, most people can't afford it or reach it, so it's a moot point that it's available which takes the funnel even lower down to a choice of 6,250 properties, of which at the point of time, the cycle and market marries up nicely to that product mix. At any one time, 25% of markets are the right places to invest in. And of course, that can reduce the number of investment grade properties down to circa 1,500 on the market at any one time. Of course, that sounds like a lot, but put into context just how many people are shopping for real estate every single weekend. In Sydney alone, there's 800 properties sold at auction per weekend. So when you're dealing with such low inventory levels, that's a challenge for most novice property investors. And of course, that's where great investment property agents come into play, buyers agents, because they spend money on research, finding investment grade real estate. They'll deal with things like Urbis, SQM, Charter Keck, B Shrapnel, Cordell's to find real estate. They'll do all sorts of checks and balances and due diligence to bring the right properties to marketplace. And of course, uh, Big part of my day is simply being part of that space, finding properties which the likelihood of them going up in value 
it's much higher than the likelihood of them going down in value. Obviously, there are some principles behind any investment. First one is leverage, other people's money. And the fact that today you can get a loan at 90% off a bank and buy an investment property is still quite amazing. Now, when you think about it, leverage is just the power of other people's money. If you had $100,000 and you didn't leverage, you got a 10% return, you would make $10,000. However, if you took your $100,000 and it allowed you to borrow a million dollars and you got a 10% return, your $100,000 can make you $100,000. Obviously, the power of leverage. So as an investor, this is the primary reason real estate is of interest to everybody. And so don't underestimate the ability to take someone else's money, the banks, and get yourself some leverage in the marketplace. But real estate, of course, is the long game. It does take a while. And according to core logic, the average capital growth rate since 1992 has been 5.4%. Now, uh, that's a long time to measure data. And that means that real estate is actually increasing in value at a nice healthy rate and typically doubles every 13.5 years, which is quite accurate from what I've seen living through that period of those 13 year cycles. Can it speed up faster than that? It absolutely can, but it's going to come down to the asset selection, not just relying on the market. Now, again, if you have a sub market performing piece of real estate and the market is performing at 5.4%, let's say you add a property performing at 3% capital growth rate, it's going to take 22.4 years for your real estate to double. Alternatively, if you can get an investment grade property, it can double much faster than even the market average, which of course, if you were to find something at say 7% capital growth rate, it could actually go on to double in 10 years. So a $700,000 property can become a $1.4 million property over that period of time. But it's going to take a bit of asset selection and hacking the system. Now, when I choose real estate, I effectively use a selection system. It's really four concepts that when I invest, I use for all investments, whether it's the share market, whether it's the uh, business market, whether it's the property market. And the, that selection system is one, capital preservation. Two, how am I going to get growth out of the asset? Three, how am I going to get a return or a yield out of the asset? And four, how am I going to get money back through the tax system buying the asset. That is really the quadrant of choosing and selecting any asset. It doesn't even have to be real estate. Capital preservation, growth yield, and tax. So knowing that, I know immediately what type of asset I want when I combine it to my investment grade purchasing concepts. And of course, for a lot of people, the idea of real estate is foreign to them and they worry about what they can, cannot control. You can't control the economy. You can't control laws and regs, consumer confidence, interest rates, economic growth, taxes, inflation, timing, geopolitical issues, you can't control it. You can't. But what you can do 
is you can hack into pockets of the real estate space. You can hack into the cycle. You can hack into a market indicators. You can hack into a property. You can equity hack location. You can equity hack land. You can equity hack a building. You can hack the tax system. And you can absolutely, absolutely create a cash flow hack to speed up your involvement in the real estate marketplace. So let's talk about cycle hacking. There are a number of ways to play the real estate market. And there's always markets within markets, but there are cycles. There's effectively three distinct cycles. There is the upswing, which is a rising market. There is the counter cycle, which is a stagnant market. And then inside of those two markets, there is something independent happening, which may be more a local occurrence happening within a major cycle. In other words, one local government area is just being benefited more than another's. You might have a declining market, but an independent part of the market rising. So ultimately, there are three spaces to the process. However, for the most part, property markets are either rising or staying still or dropping in value slightly. In general, though, when measured over a longer period of time, there is always a rise in value um, on real estate. And that can be measured all the way back to when real estate was first purchased. So in a slow market, you might ask for a bigger discount. In a strong market, you may pay a little bit extra to get into the market. That's the nature of the process. In a slow market, you might get 20% off the price, but no capital growth. In a medium marketplace, you might get uh, nothing off the purchase price, but 5% capital growth. In a strong market, you may pay 5% more than what the property's worth, but get 10% capital growth. It's the way the marketplaces move. So can you hack the cycle? Well, you can. Uh, you can ask some critical questions. What stage of the property cycle is the market currently in? What are the factors driving the property cycle? How long has the cycle been in place and is it, continue, is it likely to continue? What are the historical trends of the cycle? What is the level of supply and demand in the current cycle? And how does it impact the cycle? What are the future supply trends of the cycle? Um, and of course, all of these things allow you to analyze and hack a cycle. If you are blind to the cycle, then of course, you can run into problems. Very, very important to comprehend that a cycle is real. It's happening. Uh, there could be past growth, which means the cycle's about to reach its peak. Um, you don't want to be buying real estate at the peak of a cycle. Equally, some cycles have not grown for a long period of time, which may open up the opportunity for more growth sooner. So again, you need to study the cycles to make a good decision to find that investment grade property. Again, cycles have drivers, markets have drivers. Generally, the big six are pi, population, infrastructure, and employment. And of course, uh, there are yields, demographics, and supply and demand, which moment the market along. And again, uh, if you were to look at the uh, current cycle, there are some markets probably underpriced. Perth and Melbourne, probably the two most underpriced. However, 
equally, the ones which are seemingly rising the best seem like Brisbane and Perth. They would be considered a rising marketplace. But equally, other marketplaces will go through different patterns and get growth, such as Melbourne, Sydney, and Adelaide. They are all poised to do pretty well on what we would refer to as a property clock. So can you hack the market? Well, of course you can hack the market. You can study the marketplace. Number of homes sold, clearance rates, median sale price, days on market, inventory levels, building permits gross yields, next suburb dynamics, historical rental data, vacancy data, benchmark pricing, discount rates. You can study all of this. Segmented pricing, the rent gap, household income, local government population growth rates, zoning regulations. You can study the prominent dwelling type in a marketplace. You can study the market owner occupier structure of a marketplace, the historical property price changes in a marketplace, the supply to sales ratio, the mispriced segments of the market, the livability index of a market, and of course, the low income index of a marketplace. All of that you can hack into. And without question, um, there is no challenge whatsoever to hack that. And of course, if you want to hack faster equity, I'm a big believer in property hacking. The best models of property, property hacking are renovation. You buy something that is in need of TLC, it's not going to break the bank, you renovate it, you create an uplift, you create a result. Amalgamation buying uh, two properties side by side and amalgamating them together to make a better property. It's a great way to hack the system. Developing, it's a great way to fast track results out of real estate. Asking for a discount, easiest way to make money out of real estate is find a discount. Time with off the plan, it's a way to hack the system. If you don't want a mortgage today, Come back in three years, but get into the market, leapfrog the rate cycle. Time with pre-construction. Or you can build something. I'm a big, big believer in finding underpriced land and building on it. I think it's one of the best ways to make money out of real estate. So you can actually hack the property system. You can create faster equity. You can add value to equity. It's very, very possible. I do it all the time. People do it all the time. It's, it's just the way it is. And of course, you can create a hacking model of a location. Remember, the neighborhood effect and halo effect is just the concept if People want to stay and people want to enter a market at the same time. You get an effect that ultimately creates more demand than there is supply. A lot of that comes down to understanding some location traits. Street presence, safety, natural light, openness, first place, second, third place. All of that matters. Schools, job centers, transport, culture, shops, parks, it all matters. And of course, you can actually control what you buy and effectively create an equity hack on land. You can buy real estate with a good land to asset ratio, or you can buy real estate with a good asset to free space ratio. Uh, free space being the park across the street, all of that allows you to create equity and of course the right building and design features allows for in the improvement value to enhance the land use or the land utility so 
the right property on the right land actually improves the value of the land. So if you fly in the right real estate, you're going to hack the system. And of course, your job as a property investor is to effectively uh, buy, owner, occupier real estate. One day you need to sell to an owner, occupier to pay down debt on some other real estate you'll own. You'll never pay off your real estate. So you need to be able to control multiple assets to pay one, have one real estate pay off the debt of another property. And of course, the right property allows you to do that. And that's where design matters. Remember, design just is, is an improvement of the use of land. And of course, I always teach Design principles, reflective design logic is just beautiful properties. People see themselves in it. It's an extension of who they are, so they pay more for it. Behavioral properties, things with good lifestyle benefits to them, people will pay more for it. And functional properties with good flow, people will pay more for it. Of course, you can hack the tax system. You know, the right piece of real estate allows you to effectively control how much tax you pay. Here in Australia, you will minimize your tax if you own real estate. Most people get up on a Monday, go to work, exchange their time for a money and do not get to keep the income they work for on a Monday. They give it to the tax man. It happens all week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they finally get to hump day and they start to get their money back. They start to get their cut. But of course, if you want to get your Tuesday back and your Monday back, well, if you buy the right real estate using the four quadrant selection method, you would preserve your capital. You would get capital growth. You would get good cash flow. And of course, you would get tax back. And in real estate, depreciation and uh, some of your costs are, is money which you can claim back. And of course, uh, if it's the right property, newer property, the better, you're going to get more depreciation. If a property is younger, older than 1987, i.e. 1986, unless it's been renovated, you're not claiming depreciation on the building. Again, um, it's just a way of turning a non-cash payment into cash. Uh, you physically have not paid anything other than you've leveraged to buy the real estate and now you're getting cash put into your uh, back pocket by lowering your tax rate depreciation. It helps you get to the cash flow point. And of course, I love hacking into cash flow, cash flow hacks. I've got literally 13 cash flow hacks, which allows real estate to get a higher yield based on certain parameters. Now, I've done a podcast on my 13 cash flow hacks, so I'm not going to spend time doing it today. But ultimately, the essential eight is to hack the cycle, hack the market, create a equity hack on the property, create an equity hack on the location, create an equity hack on the land, create an equity hack on the building, equity hack uh, the tax system and hack the cash flow system. If you can do all that, then all of a sudden you're going to put yourself in a position where you've got the right strategy, the right approach, and you'll get the right result. So I hope that kind of makes sense. Uh, you can make money out of real estate. Real estate is probably the best vehicle to grow your wealth here in Australia. So get cracking, folks. Um, Hope that was helpful. That's it for me. I'm going back to my, uh, my aluminium cup of coffee. All the best. 
Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.